So um, what I'm going to talk about today is, um, oh, there is the logo. Um, a couple of things. I just wanted, I wanted to really focus on a community development strategy that we are working on right now, uh, designing and implementing in Canada. Uh, but before I go into details about that, I thought I should contextualize it and tell, us, tell you a little bit about the issue of violence for people with disabilities in Canada and a particular focus on women with disabilities. So uh, this is no surprise to you that over the last decade, studies have confirmed that people with disabilities experience violence at a much higher rate than the non-disabled population. Um, with men with intellectual disabilities, we see the statistics here from Canada, 32% um, to 54% have been sexually abused. And I can give you all the citations for all this after. I think there's also a paper that um, I summarized this under. Um, and sexual offense is mo more um, often the common type of abuse that women with disabilities experience. They, women with disabilities are sexually assaulted at a rate at least twice that of the general population of women, and the rate for women with intellectual disabilities and deaf women is even higher than other women with disabilities. And I just wanted to put a little footnote here when I was preparing this uh, presentation. We, in Canada, we talk about people with disabilities and deaf people. We make that distinction, and that's a very important distinction in, in our culture. Uh, because the deaf community, and I'm not sure what it's like here, but the deaf community in Canada is, uh, can, do not consider themselves people with disabilities. They are a distinct culture with a distinct language. And so we're always, you'll notice throughout my presentation that distinction is, is, is usually made. 80% um, of women with disabilities have experienced violence by their intimate partners compared to 29%. And uh, this is a, a, a very alarming statistic that 83% of women with disabilities will be sexually abused in their lifetime. Um, 40 to 70% of girls with intellectual disabilities will be sexually abused before the age of 18. And another finding we had was that 80% of psychiatric inpatients have experienced physical or sexual abuse. Uh, abuse is not isolated, it, is, it tends to be ongoing and often uh, when the, it is perpetuated by caregivers. And less per, than 25% of sexual violence is limited to one episode. So why does this happen? And I think uh, you did a beautiful <laughs> overview of why this happens, so I just uh, will we'll go through it, that it's the negative public attitudes, um, uh, sort of a societal fear of disability, the social and economic isolation of people with disabilities, as uh, Chiang outlined, that it is very systemic. Uh, there is a higher reliance on caregivers in people with disabilities' lives, and also a number of different caregivers as well. And there is the lack of support for caregivers. There is uh, a lack of availability of safe alternatives, and a huge piece is the lack of credibility of people with disabilities, as we saw in, in the film clip, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And also the issue of socialization of people with disabilities to be uh, compliant. And I think, uh, John, you had mentioned in your presentation just that people, was it your presentation? Mm -hmm. that talked about um, being thankful for the services that they get. And, and so in this sense, is that uh, sort of that um, due to the isolation. Uh, there's ineffective safeguards. There's a lack of accessible services, whether that's legal services and advocates. And then we um, also do a big focus, as, as you may or may not know, Canada is extremely diverse in terms of, uh, it's a huge country, I realize that coming here. Because <laughs> I was last week, I, I live in Toronto, and I was in Vancouver, and I realized it, take, it takes me about as much time to get out west as it does to come here. So, but because of that, there's a lot of regional diversity, there's a lot of immigrant and a refugee and ethno-racial diversity, and there's a huge uh, diversity just in terms of our different cultures and our different provinces. So there are these multiple factors that um, are, are due to the intersect and marginalized statuses, and I learned a new concept today, so minoritize. I like that much better because uh, that's clearly what it is. Um, and so what happens is that along with the disability, there's lack of accessible information about Canadian laws and human rights. There's an increased dependency on their sponsor, who usually, often case, is um, the abuser. And there's also a fear of jeopardizing immigration status. 
Uh, for women with disabilities, it's a fear of their children being um, removed and, and taken custody of. And also the fear of being ostracized from your ethnic community. And this is a very similar uh, thing we find with women, um, with deaf women, is that uh, the community is very small and it's very known. And often if your abuser is your partner, um, you know, it, it's very difficult to come out and disclose violence. And there's a distrust and a lack of confidence in the police, particularly from immig immigrant communities. So I'll just kind of go through this a little faster. Um, another huge issue is the lack of English or French. Um, in, in Canada, we're a bilingual country. And if new immigrants don't have either, and particularly um, in the deaf community, if they don't have ASL or FSL, which is the French and the English, um, it's very, very hard to access any kinds of services. I was going to show you an excerpt from a film, but I think I'm going to go to the end, and I don't think we'll have time for it, So, and I don't think I'm really prepared for it. But I wanted to show it just to give you sort of a, a clip of the um, nature of abuse and, and sort of the history. Uh, this is a film um, that uh, I produced, um, was directed by Pierre Tetro. And it is looking at the history of people with intellectual disabilities in Canada up until modern time today. And it just looks at the history of institutionalization and the abuse and, and going into our deinstitutionalization movement and uh, the struggles that people are living with now. So what I wanted to do is just very quickly go through um, some of the results of a national study that was just conducted earlier this year with the, the Disabled Women's Network of Canada. And I've got some handouts, some information that you can take. I've only, I didn't bring as enough, but uh, I've got some that you can take with you. Um, so there was a study that we did with a broad range of women with disabilities. Um, it was women, abused women. So women that have experienced violence um, from very diverse backgrounds. Um, and this is the kinds of um, abuse that was reported. Um, and that's the nature of it, um, uh, psychological and verbal abuse, was name-calling bullying. Uh, a big thing we heard was threatening to withhold primary care, uh, threatening physical harm. So the threatening piece was very, very big. Um, financial abuse, one thing we heard a lot about was caregivers taking disability social assistance checks from them, withholding that money, and that was something that is really happening across the country. Um, paid caregivers using women's money for their own personal needs and pleasures and controlling that use. Um, there was a lot we heard about abuse by the system, just rude and disrespectful behavior from healthcare professionals, whether it was in hospitals, social workers, very bad rap on a social worker, so I'm ashamed to say that I'm a social worker, um, and really bad uh, interactions with the justice system. Uh, we heard uh, stories of extreme physical violence. I do a lot of anti-violence work in Canada with a, a number of different groups, and I've never heard like this kind of level of the kinds of things that we're, we were rep hearing reporting. Uh, a big thing, um, and I was talking to some women today at lunch, and that's why I was kind of late. I don't know if they're here. Yeah, from the brain injury group, is that violence results, uh, it's the violence that res uh, the disability resulted from. And we particularly heard a lot from women that were living with traumatic brain injuries and just um, how, that, how that was affected by that. Um, sexual abuse by those in position of authority, child sexual abuse, and often the abusers were family members, um, and very violent rapes by male partners, uh, particularly with women with mobility uh, disabilities and um, inappropriate touching by caregivers when uh, washing, bathing, and dressing women was very, very common. Um, and these are some of the other uh, denial of services and inappropriate treatment by caregivers, being forced to live in inaccessible homes, so uh, intentionally making the living environment inaccessible to increase the control over the individual. And often we heard about, through the service agencies, male caregivers being sent to provide personal primary care for women, which was, you know, really, there's no choice in who they send, and that often happened. Um, and I just wanted to go back. This was a case a woman called the office um, 
to just to say that she had been left in soiled clothing for two days because she had a fight with her caregiver, who was her husband, and he just basically left. And she, you know, so this is the kind of thing that uh, happens with increased isolation. So um, there's been a number of cases, and we heard one during the focus groups of being refused to service if you have a mental health disability because um, so-called protocol and procedures, they're not allowed to deal with women that are having, that are exhibiting any kind of so-called acting out, that they have to be referred to the hospital, and that's extremely problematic. Um, so I'll just kind of go through this so I can get to the strategy, but uh, cyberbullying was something I noticed you had in yours as well. This is a huge issue now, and I think it's, it's having a, quite a huge impact on uh, people with disabilities, particularly people uh, and women with intellectual disabilities, um, and that's through email, instant messaging, um, sending of hurtful images, cyber sexual abuse, and bullies using technology. And so the question is, um, who are the abusers? So I think one of the biggest things that um, in Canada we talk a lot about the violence against women's sector. I don't know if it's similar here, mm -hmm. but really what that is, it's like the shelter movement, um, the hospital, sexual assault centers, all the groups that sort of look at um, violence against women, which is really, really focused on intimate partner abuse. And while that certainly is occurring with women with disabilities, um, quite often it's not at the same um, extent as it is with uh, non-disabled women. So often um, it's healthcare providers, so there's increased risk due to reliance on the healthcare system, as I mentioned earlier. Also this idea that there's more than one caregiver in their, in their lives, so there's more opportunities for abuse. And when violence is not sexual, we found that the offender is more likely to be a woman. Um, and this is in the order uh, in which we heard um, who the offenders are. Number one, which uh, really surprised me, was that mother and father was sort of the top um, caregivers, both male or female, healthcare professionals, and so that would include things like institutional res residential staff. Husbands, boyfriends, and partners. So again, you can see just down the rung, it's, it's fourth. Whereas so much of the violence against women sector in Canada is organized around sort of the idea of intimate partner abuse. Other family relatives and transit drivers, accessible transit drivers and attendant care workers or interpreters. <laughs> <laughs> And so I just wanted to share um, some quotes um, just to give the voices of the women that we spoke to, uh, to bring them here. Um, these are two quotes um, that they described what the abuse was like. One woman was saying, my boyfriend told me I was ugly and I was lucky that he was with me because of my disability. Uh, my boyfriend raped me and cracked my head on a bed while raping me. This is a woman that was talking about her, uh, how she uh, got her disability. Uh, whoops. And this one was particularly um, um, uh, saddening. Uh, the specialist took out a copy. This is a woman that was originally from, I, I believe she was from Africa. She had worked uh, professionally as a nurse. Um, she was sexually abused and the abuse resulted in a brain injury. And so this is, she had to go see a variety of different specialists and that whole system was, the system was re-abusing her. Um, so it was on multiple levels when we're talking about the intersections of multiple dynamics of marginalization. So she was a woman of color, uh, an immigrant, uh, and a woman with a disability. So she's and a survivor of sexual assault. Um, so the specialist took out a copy of National Geographic, and this is after she had just said to him, you know, I'm really not doing well. Like I'm, this is really hard. I'm not doing well. So this is how he he addressed it took out a, p a copy of National Geographic and showed me a picture and said, do you know how lucky you are to be in this country? You're complaining about a headache. This is suffering. You are not suffering. And she said, there was a time when everything was good, safe, before I came to Canada. I didn't know what sexual abuse was before I came here. I felt like telling them that. So the biggest thing, as we heard, was uh, what stood in the way is just simply not being believed. 
There are so many barriers to get to the point of disclosure and reporting, and when women actually did it, they weren't believed. They weren't believed by police, their family. I heard, um, oh, just heartbreaking stories about, you know, a woman lying in a hospital bed and, uh, you know, very, very badly uh, physically abused by her boyfriend. And the mother just sitting by the bed and just saying, I don't think this happened. Like, you fell, something happened. I don't think he did this. Nice guy, you know. So it, it's pretty intense when it's the people that you considered, you know, and she considered herself to have a supportive family. Um, counselors, shelter workers, heard a lot about uh, shelter workers for women with mental health issues. Just completely, it was, it was the most traumatic thing. Uh, lawyers, doctors, nurses, social workers. And as, um, as uh, Xing Yang pointed out, that the lack of awareness, we heard so much that what they were experiencing they didn't realize was abuse. That, that is, so this whole, oh, five minutes remaining, okay. Lack of money and don't know where to go to get help. So uh, just some differences with, we spoke to all these different women. Um, episodic disabilities are disabilities like HIV and some mental health disabilities, et cetera. Uh, so I just, maybe I'll go through this since I'm getting to the end. And uh, with First Nations and Métis women, um, that, again, they had a stronger sense that this is just the way it was. They felt a lot of abuse was coming from the, sort of the white, the mainstream system, and there weren't the kinds of services on, on the reserves uh, where some of them uh, still live. Um, and there was a real lack of culturally uh, sensitive uh, training. So what came out of it were recommendations uh, to create groups where women could meet regularly and talk about the abuse together, uh, having skilled disability sensitive and free counseling services, having a safety protocol in place and protection process when one woman leaves and putting temporary money in place. Money is a big issue for, for keeping women there. And uh, have women work on short and long-term planning there needs to be a system analysis to identify where women with disabilities are not being uh, pro appropriately served and uh, sensitivity and training raising for all sectors. So uh, I just wanted to, before I talk about the strategy, I wanted to make sure that also it's embedded in sort of a cultural framework of understanding a value base similar to what you were saying that we, we look, understand it, that people are not defined by their marginality and their people first and foremost and um, again, it's a social model that focuses on the, um, the society's lack of accommodation, or that is society that has a disability. Um, so, right, and just not to objectify people and to start with the individual first. So, um, so this is the strategy. It occurs in two phases. There's research, applied research would be done in order to develop um, a toolkit which would have um, a series of different modules and a strategy for implementation of that. Um, and then we would be able to do an implementation. And these are the eight modules we think are gonna arise. We haven't done the applied research yet, but based on our, uh, our uh, environmental scan and secondary research. We want to do training with the justice system. We want to do a model for supported uh, credibility, uh, violence against women sector training, health and social services, and that would include the merging of the violence against women sector and the disability sectors, because I don't know if it's like this here, but they operate in silos and they don't talk to each other. None of these do. Um, and um, a workshop for women, a workshop for men, and then how to conduct a safety audit. So this it's a, it's a local level community development uh, strategy that's rooted in the community. So we would start off with small towns to large whichever. If each province or territory, we have 13 provinces and territories in Canada, would select for the pilot implementation one town or one urban center so it works from the bottom up. And we would get a national advisory committee, um, have lead organizations in each city uh, to give it the institutional backing and hire a local organizer. And so it begins by calling together in that local community all the key sectors that would be involved in the prevention and the response of violence. And uh, people with disabilities who are, very, who are very concerned about the issue of violence and abuse. Then from that would become a local convener group which would be like a local advisory committee 
it would result in doing workshops with people with disabilities, um, uh, rights information, um, what to do, what to expect if you're going through the, the justice system in a men's working group. So um, then the local agencies would be engaged in an audit process, and I can tell you a little bit more about it later if you want to follow up with me, but here is a document, and I've got 10 of these to give out. First come, first serve. Um, and it's a, <laughs> it's a community safety audit, which is based on the Duluth model. Um, in Duluth, Minnesota, there was a, a wonderful um, uh, a local audit. Some of you may be aware of it. It's pretty well known. We've adapted it to people with disabilities and specifically intellectual disabilities. With this project, we want to broaden it to be all people with disabilities with a gender-based analysis as well. Um, and then, uh, so it basically is a very kind of uh, methodological eight-step process which looks at where the gap between what people experience and what agencies aim to provide and how that gap's produced. So it works, um, support workers are given the tools to gather all the pertinent background information to support individuals. People from that same community are supported in developing self-identified, realistic, short and long-term plans. And this, their plans then are matched with the individual. So um, the whole thing, one minute remaining, we don't need more services. I loved, what was it somebody said, Rachel said this morning in her presentation, services can't love me or something like that. And that, that's exactly kind of the framework in which this is built on. The, uh, the services supports don't dictate uh, people's plans for a better life. The plans are based on what people want and dream of, and then you build the capacity of the local community to meet those plans. And then, as a last resort, services are plugged into that plan, those plannings. And I was going to go through an example of the justice sector, but I don't think I'm going to be able to. But um, basically, um, one of the things that I did want to do is talk a bit about this model for supported credibility, which I'm hoping, I don't know if he's here, Gerard Quinn? We're hoping, oh yes, he is here, yes. Uh, we're hoping to get Irish expertise on developing this. Um, and it essentially, we had a big court case um, in uh, Canada, which um, a, a young woman was sexually abused by, a young woman with an intellectual disability was sexually abused by her stepfather. And it, got, it went into court and they, they did not believe that she had the capacity to be a credible witness. So they had to demonstrate, they wanted to demonstrate that she understood what an oath was and what uh, to promise to tell the truth meant. And then they used these abstract kind of con uh, concepts to, get to demonstrate whether she understood the concept of truth and promise. And of course she didn't because there were things like, you know, what color paint is that? Is there blue paint on the wall? You know, things like that. Anyways, it was thrown out of court and, and the accused was acquitted. And then the Disabled Women's Network and another organization, a legal action group, uh, we acted as interveners in the case, um, just basically saying that, that she had the right to be supported in terms of, of supporting her credibility. So we want to be able to give those, um, as you see, the onus is on the witness to communicate and demonstrate their credibility by themselves. And uh, so what we want to do here and we draw on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which does say that people have the right to supports when exercising their legal capacity. Um, and we want to be able to um, develop tools for those that are uh, charged with um, directing and implementing and managing uh, people's uh, uh, credibility. So I'm at my end. And I Thanks wanted to tell you why, why this community development strategy works, but uh, hopefully you can get a copy of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.